Um, so I thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Michael Tiern. Uh, we're going to talk today about essentials for the first year. So to start off with, when I'm in this mode, I cannot see the chat or the um, or the participant box where you can raise your hand, but I do want to encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Do it whatever way is comfortable for you. I'm going to stop periodically to go back to look at the chat and to see if anybody has their hands up um, when I'm ready for questions. But if I'm getting too far along in the presentation, you're like, what, what was that he said? Or I need a clarification. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, so whatever way works for you is fine. We're, this is casual. This is about you guys and what information that you need. So whatever works for you is great today. Um, so I, can raise your, on, I can keep an eye on the chat for you if you like. Thanks, Joel. That'd be great. Okay, perfect. That'd be great. And I'll try to, to periodically um, stop for questions and things. So we're going to talk about essentials for the first year today. Um, I don't, my purpose of this is not to go over everything you need to know from start to finish, because that's just too overwhelming. I know you've got a bunch of information that you're trying to absorb doing the D2L orientation and um, all these presentations that we have, besides talking with your faculty advisors and working out things with me and, and our office and financial aid, and you got a lot going on. So I don't want to bog down in a ton of details, but I do want to kind of put some things um, within your awareness and hopefully help you to focus in on just a few things. Now, so some of this stuff is just information that I think is important for you to know, but it's not like this is the first and last time we're gonna talk about it. Um, so don't worry about getting everything exactly right here, but please do ask questions. So the main objective for this presentation is to provide information and insight for the best possible start into your program. And then that slide is there just to remind me to make sure I started the recording. So uh, we haven't had a great, we had an introduction on Tuesday to the orientation, but we haven't talked about the specific objectives for orientation. Um, this orientation is a product of all the orientations that went before it and the feedback that we've gotten from students um, in previous years about what they appreciated and what they didn't appreciate. Of course, this year is a little bit different in that we're doing everything online um, instead of having a two-day in-person orientation that went from like 8.30 in the morning to 5. So some of the folks um, who are current students helped to conceptualize how we're doing it this year. The main objectives remain the same, which is relationship building for success with fellow students, relationship building for success with faculty, and those two are the ones that we focus in on most with these live sessions. And that's why I really wanted, really encouraged all of you to try to make it to the live sessions and to, um, and why it's mandatory on that Thursday and Friday before school starts, because this is where we're interacting with other human beings and building those relationships. And as a um, research student, pursuing a master's of science or a doctoral degree, relationship building is an important skill to use and build upon. Uh, providing information and insights for the best possible start into your program, that's woven throughout orientation, explore the importance of self-care in grad school, which is something I think is very important. Before I jump into the meat of my presentation, I want to go back and review a little bit of Jenna's presentation on Tuesday, because there were some things that really resonated with me that she said that I want to put in the, I want to reinforce with y'all. So one of the things she talked about was the importance of connections um, and how important connections are to us as, as social animals, as social beings, um, in just how we deal with stress and the world. Um, you know, particularly a doctoral degree, like master's students, you're setting off on a 10K 
um, doctoral students, you're setting off on, on a marathon. It's a long stretch. And you're coming into this program differently than you've come into your previous degree because you're in a different place in your life. Hey, Michael, um, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't think you're screen sharing. I'm not sure. Is, is everybody able to see the uh, PowerPoint slides? No. Oh, dang it. I can see them. So what were you saying? Were you just seeing me? I think it's it's sharing now, yes. I think you're good. Okay, I think every time I switch a slide, I suspect that that's going to happen, but let's see. Let's see. Um, so the importance of connections. Okay, so we're gonna weave that. So I just want to kind of emphasize the importance of being intentional about um, making connections. She also talked about managing expectations. Um, and there, you know, her point was, you know, you're gonna come in and things might not be exactly as you thought they were. Um, there's lots of twists and turns, especially in research. That's kind of the part of the nature and part of the beauty and, and wonderfulness of research is that it does take twists and turns and you learn things you didn't expect to learn or it goes, you know, your, your main thesis is, doesn't turn out the way you think it's gonna turn out. Um, life takes similar twists and turns. So just know that that's just normal, that's natural. Some of that's gonna happen, you know, and you know, you've got a support system though to work through these things. She, I love this, as she said, exhaustion is not a badge of honor. Um, you know, you're here because you are all driven to like do great things. You know, I find that doctoral students, master's students, undergrad students in public health are all a bunch of idealists who are out to change the world. And you're like intrinsically motivated. You're probably used to getting very good grades and doing great. And I'm sure you're gonna continue to do really well. Um, but, you know, being able to say no is a great skill to have. Um, you know, some, it, I'm speaking from having done this for six years, been in this coordinator position and seeing different, different um, situations prop up, right? It, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in our college and it's great to get involved and I encourage you to get involved, but also please kind of keep some limits on it because you can get sucked up into um, a lot of really great stuff and overdo it. And occasionally that comes from um, a faculty member that you're doing research with that can put a lot on your plate. Um, so just be mindful of those kind of things and please do say no when you need to. Okay, I'm moving to the next. You probably can't see that. Nope. So can you share your screen instead of the maybe the PowerPoint slide? So change the view. Maybe that might help. What do you mean? Um, there's like different screens that you can share on the computer. So if you share just the PowerPoint screen, sometimes that fixes it instead of sharing your whole screen. Oh. It's okay. We can. <laughs> Can I can show you later. There's a look of like bleep. So <laughs> I think I am doing that. The the problem the problem's a little bit more complicated. I think it's because I'm on a VPN and this view is actually on my computer at work while I'm working from a laptop at home. So I think it's having a difficulty toggling between those is is my take on that. If that makes sense. But we'll we'll see. We'll, we'll see. Okay, so here's a quote from Michael Tiernan. This is going to go on my gravestone. Be purposeful and strategic. Um, I want to just, just, you're going to hear that from me probably some more throughout this, but just as we're thinking about lots of different things, course choices, committees that you're going to put together, minors that you're going to choose, just I want to encourage you to kind of be purposeful and strategic about how you go about that. Okay, so we're going to have just a little bit of a discussion now. Um, 
So who or what makes up your personal support system? So, and I'm gonna take two things off the, two things out right away. So family and close friends are obvious answers. Uh, but if you wanna use the chat box or unmute yourself, what, who or what else, just do a little quick brainstorming, who or what else are part of our personal support systems? Put it in the chat if you like. I was going to say, cool. one of the things that um, I rely on to give me strength and I feel supported is when I exercise first in the morning, kind of sets the tone for the rest of the day. Great. So exercise routine, perfect. I see three boxers, three boxer dogs at home, my doggo, faculty advisor, my family, sports teams that you're on or clubs that you're on, um, spiritual or religious organizations that you are a part of. Um, all, there's all kinds of different ways to have support and things that you go to. Um, and again, you know, this is obvious and it might feel a little elementary school for me to ask that, but I want you to be purposeful and strategic in thinking about who and what are my support systems and making sure that you, you take that, those support systems with you through this journey that you're, you're setting, um, you're setting yourself on. So definitely family. Yep. Family. Absolutely. Okay. So we're going to, I want to talk a little bit about your professional support system. So these are like the first five things that come to my mind when I think about who your professional support system is in your graduate work. And I put your program handbook as the first thing because that's where you get a wealth of information about what you need to do for your steps going forward. Um, your faculty advisor, um, is definitely somebody who is there for you to support you. Um, they can be part of your personal support system also because a lot of these people are going to become folks that hang with you through not only your degree, but, but beyond. Um, they're people who are gonna become professional references for you, who are gonna be um, official and unofficial mentors for you. Um, they are important and your match with them in this program was a part in, it was an important part of the admissions process too. There's me, your MS and doctoral coordinator. I'm here to be part of your support system, um, whether it's questions about your handbook or the next milestone that you're coming up on, or you know you're, you're looking for some sort of resource, or you forgot the you know how to get a hold of Jenna, um, or you just need some sort of community or college resource or help with something, you know, we're here, my, our whole office is here to help support you. Um, and then of course, Chris, our Assistant Dean for Student Alumni Affairs. Most of you have probably been working with her, maybe about scholarships or teaching assistantships um, and your program directors. And I put them there so you would know who your program director was for your program. So you can kind of eyeball who it is that is in charge of your program um, here in the college. They can be a resource for you um, if you are having problems within um, the program that maybe you know, going to your faculty advisor is not um, a good solution. Um, they can be there to help problem solve also. Okay. So, a little bit more about, about me as your as part of that support system. Um, I know you can't see this slide, but that's fine. Um, 
So I'm doing all kinds, I'm here to help you from start to finish. I, I participate in recruitment, in missions, this onboarding experience. I'm here to help you support, support you in you know, figuring out your transfer work in going through policies, processes, and procedures. I'm trying to connect with you via email um, at least once a semester with, hey, here's kind of some things to be thinking about for you know, this semester. Um, I'm going to be a resource for you when you do your, your official plan of study um, as you're getting your graduate committees together for you know, your thesis defense or your comp exams or your dissertation defense. Um, I'm a part of the comprehensive exam process. Um, I'm part of the qualifying exam process um, as you're getting ready for your thesis and dissertation defenses and then getting you graduated and out the door um, as well. So please use me as part of your professional support system. I would encourage you to come see me you know, once a semester. It would be great to have you um, come and stop by. Just let me know how things are going. Um, I'm going to try, I'm going to have some walk-in virtual hours. I don't know how much I'm going to actually be physically present in the office this coming semester, um, but I'm going to try to have some virtual walk-in hours where you can just kind of log on to a Zoom link and um, for particular hours during the week. And I think that's on another slide. Um, and you can, you know, just tell me how you're doing. Tell me how the week's going. Uh, but it's great to see you at least once a semester, but definitely you know, four to six months, the semester before, you're going to do your comp exams, you're going to defend your thesis, you're going to defend your dissertation. Um, if there are issues that are coming up, um, problems that you're having, I don't have all the solutions, but we are pretty good problem solvers in our office, and we're pretty good at getting you to the resources that you need. Um, so don't wait for your faculty advisor to send you. Feel free to come in um, when you need to. So office hours, these um, hours that, I'll send this out. You guys are the first to see this. I haven't even told my, my boss yet that I'm doing this, <laughs> but I'll send this out in the Friday email, um, either this week or maybe next week. But I'm gonna try this starting in late August through September, um, just have four hours of walk-in. I can increase that if this is popular, but there'll be just a basic Zoom link that you can come to. Just come by and see me during. Okay. So what we're gonna go through from this point forward is I just wanna do a brief overview of some milestones to graduation. Talk about some um, advising, the different kind of advising roles of different people that will be part of your experience with us. We'll cover some forms and processes as you get started. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about handbooks and catalogs and then some other pertinent um, miscellaneous categories. So the passcode though, I'm sending you the passcode, um, is seven for this. So number seven is the passcode. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, all the presentations have a passcode, and it's just kind of how we're taking attendance um, that you know, you're either coming live or watching it um, taped. And so you're gonna have to report the passcode later on. So seven is the passcode for this presentation. Okay, so major milestones for the Masters of Science students. Here are some of your milestones from start to finish. You know, drafting, drafting your plan of study. So also getting your transfer work and your course substitutions um, settled. That'd be great to do your first semester. I'm gonna talk more specifically about this in a few more slides. Um, selecting committee members. Now, this also goes for doctoral students. Um, selecting committee members is a process that happens through the time of your, and actually beyond your comprehensive exams. So 
what I mean by this is not that your first year you've got your committee together um, necessarily, but actually starting with this orientation, because part of what you're going to do during this orientation is meet faculty in your department, um, is to start thinking about who is doing really cool research, who has a skill set that you um, really want to acquire yourself, who is just somebody in faculty that is really supportive of you, that you really click with, um, those kind of things. Like who are some of the faculty who are going to be a good um, part of your committee later on? Because everyone's gonna need a committee of at least, um, well, MS students are gonna need a committee of three. Doctoral students are gonna need a comp exam committee of four and a dissertation committee of three. So everyone's gonna to need to have you know, three or four different faculty as part of their committee. And sometimes it's more than that. And it can be more than that. Um, so I want you to think about getting to know the faculty and right from the start here in orientation on the 20th, you'll have your first opportunity to meet several of the faculty um, and start thinking about how that goes. Qualifying exams uh, for biostatistics in the, uh, for MS students. Um, and then you see there are some other milestones, but it's gonna be those first three that we're gonna concentrate on during this. I'm gonna say a little bit more about plan of study, a little bit more about qualifying exams. Now, are there, I'm gonna stop for just a moment. Are there any questions at this point from um, MS students or anybody else? I don't see anybody asking questions. Okay, cool. We will move on to talk a little bit about doctoral students. Um, so it's kind of the same, the first three things that, you know, I want you to think about a little, you know, kind of put at the front of your brain today um, is drafting that plan of study, selecting committee members, um, the qualifying exam um, is just for epi and biostats students. Um, think we could talk, we'll talk, talk a little bit about your minor today, because I think that's, um, important topic because you're, you're planning your coursework for um, your first year or at least kind of thinking about it. Um, there seems to be a lot of questions about plan of study uh, and about choosing a, mi a minor and we'll also talk about um, plan of study. Um, some of the other milestones that you all have, I'm sorry if this is very annoying to you but hopefully not too bad. Um, some of the other minor are uh, some of the other major milestones for doctoral students includes getting your research proposal together, um, your written comprehensive exams, oral comprehensives, um, your proposal for your, for your defense, or your proposal defense. So this is for DRPH students. Again, let me do this again. So everybody needs to have a research proposal after comprehensive exams before you start working on dissertation work. It looks differently for everybody. Um, it, every program is different. So this is where your handbook becomes really important because the very the specifics of this kind of stuff is in your handbook. But you'll need to have a research proposal put together. Um, sometimes that's part of the written comps. Sometimes it comes after comprehensive exams. It's a little bit different. But then, you, and you've written your oral comprehensive exams, it's really the same we talk about it as kind of separate exams, but it's really one exam because you either pass the whole thing or you don't. Um, and then there is a proposal defense that our DRPH students do, which is presenting to your committee um, what you plan to do for your applied dissertation. Then, you know, between that bullet and the dissertation is a lot, it's a lot. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's like, oh, your next step is, you know, dissertation, but it's like, there's a ton, ton of stuff to do um, in there. That's where like the majority of your work happens. And then there's the final defense. Okay, I'm going to just pause right there to see if doctoral students have any um, questions at this moment. I have a question, Michael. Um, yes. Well, maybe even two. Uh, 
First of all, is the handbook on the hub for this year or should we be referencing last year's handbook? So as far as, uh, it's good, thank you. It's not, next year's is not there yet. So as okay. far as like doing, you know, the like assignments on D2L that ask you to look at the handbook, use the 1920 one. Um, okay. The 2021 one um, is still being finalized and it probably won't show up until like right before our classes start, but it will be out before. I shouldn't say I shouldn't say anything definite. I'm going to do my very best, and our office is doing the very best to get the final version out um, by the first day of class. No trouble. And then my other question is: Do you is it optimal to have taken all of your courses before you take comps, or is there a little bit of simultaneous? Is anything simultaneous? Is the dissertation work completely after comps, or is it pretty linear? It's a, it's it's a little different in, in every program. So there's two different questions there. One is about coursework and comprehensive exams, and the other about dissertation work and comprehensive exams. So I thought the, there was like five questions. I promised one, and I kept going. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, I bet everybody else is wondering about that too. Those are good ones. So you do not need to have all of your coursework done to take your comprehensive exams. The threshold you need to meet is different for every program. Some programs say 75%, some say 80, some say 85%. So look at your handbook. Um, we want you to have the majority of your coursework done uh, because you're going to be you're going to be tested on it, right? So, um, and some courses are more key to that process than other keys than other classes. So, for example you know, um, in the DRPH program, um, that maternal and child health course is, is a pretty important part of the comprehensive exam. So we wanna make sure everybody has that knowledge. Either you, gotten, you got that knowledge in your master's degree or you're taking it now with us. So some classes are more important than others for the comprehensive exam, but the actual threshold that you need to reach to um, be eligible to take your comprehensive exams is a little bit different in every program. Now, when it comes to your minor work, minors are like small, right? They're like nine units, maybe 12 or 15 units, depending on which one you sign up for. We want you to have like almost all of that done because again, if, you, if you've only gotten like one of the courses done, then there's not a lot to test you on. Um, so we want you to be mostly done, but there is some wiggle room. Now, starting dissertation work before your comprehensive exam is, that's a hard question because I don't, I can't tell you the definitive answer for it because, um, so like in the DRPH, that would be a no-no. They don't want you to start that. But it seems like in the other, like I know like in biostatistics, it seems like they are doing that work ahead of time. So that's really a conversation to have. There's not a set rule, except for with DRPH that says no. Um, but with the other, which makes sense because it's an applied dissertation anyway. So it's like, you know, um, you got to have your proposal approved before you can go out into the world. So that is pretty linear and it wouldn't make sense to do the dissertation work earlier. So it's not like it's a, it, it's just a different experience. And that's why it's like that. But I, I don't totally know the answer and I couldn't tell you like what every program does exactly. There's not a, a rule that says it's absolutely forbidden for the PhD degrees, but it really kind of varies by the culture and um, sometimes by the particular faculty member that you have too. So have that discussion with your faculty member when it comes time to that for that. Kim. Um, I have a quick question about the plan of study. You mentioned that it was part of your role. And then also I worked with my mentor to come up with my classes for the first semester. So is that pretty typical? Do we run it by you to make sure we've hit all the bases or just go with it? So your academic advisor is your faculty advisor. So they're the ones who are guiding you in your course choices and, um, and they're the content experts. And at, you know, at this stage in your educational career, you know, it's like you're getting more and more specialized. So they're the ones who are the best guide for you. I work with you on your official plan of study yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of 
on the periphery of the process. So I'm gonna you know, be part of, you know, I'm the policy process paperwork guy. So it's like, you're gonna get your course substitutions to me. You know, I'm gonna be the person that you or your faculty person asks, you know, kind of some technical questions of. When it comes time to submit your official plan of study, I'm gonna be the first person to look at it and I'm gonna say, oh, Kim did everything by the book, great. Or Kim did, you know, did, took all of these classes, but got substitutions for this class, got this one waived. You know, I'm the one who's making sense of everything and helping to like document it in official documents. So that's kind of, that's my role. So when it comes time for your official plan of study to be submitted, um, it's important for us to have some good communication and make sure that I understand everything in your plan of study so that I can communicate that to the graduate college who ultimately has to approve it. Thank you. You're welcome. Olushola. Right, thank you. Yeah, I would like to know, um, when should the research proposal be ready? Is it um, during the spring or after the fall semester? I need to know the, the timeline for the research proposal to be ready. For the research proposal? Yes. Remind me what program you're in? Elemental Health Sciences. Okay. So that's going to be, if, if you get that done towards like the, the end of your second year, you're probably doing pretty good. Because, you know, that's going to be part, that's going to be wrapped up in your comprehensive exams and generally comprehensive exams happen towards the end of your second year at kind of the earliest. So unless you come in with like a ton of transfer work. Um, that's kind of, kind of that, yeah. Okay, Thank good. You. You're welcome. Good, good questions. Um, so, Michael, before you go on, I have a question. Okay, Francis. Um, so, uh, how many transfer credit can one carry to the PhD program? It depends, it's again, that's very specific by your program. So for biostatistics, okay. you can use 23 units that you used previously, uh, that you earned previously. For um, DRPH, it's 18 units, but that does not include the 15 units of prerequisites that they have. And for the other PhD programs, it's 30 units. For okay. Master's of Science students, um, if you've got another master's degree um, or you took courses at another um, institution, you can use 20%. So that's usually, I think most of our master's of science degrees are 42 units. Um, we round that up to nine. The grad college rounds that up to nine. So it's a little bit different for everybody. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So we've talked kind of about this already, but you can see here like the different folks that you have for um, advising. You know, faculty advisor in bold, definitely that's the person you're gonna go to. Um, you're all starting off with one particular faculty advisor. It's possible to change faculty advisors if you find someone who is a better fit for your research interests or you get a research assistantship with and you really wanna you know, take that work into your dissertation work. Um, it is possible um, to, to do that. Have a good conversation with your current faculty advisor and don't be afraid to have that conversation. Um, if you do want to make a change like that, they're almost always completely supportive. They want what's best for you. And again, you've got a program director that's the head of the program. You're going to have a comprehensive exam committee and a comprehensive exam committee chair. That's oftentimes your faculty advisor, but not always. Um, then you you're going to have um, a dissertation or a thesis director someone who's going to be the main person that you are doing your research or your applied dissertation um, with. Um, you've got committee members for your dissertation um, and you've got me as well. And I'm here to help guide you and answer questions and hopefully make things less confusing for you. So any questions about that? Okay. Um,
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this stuff. And this is, I've had conversations with a few of you about, about this already, and we've already kind of touched on this, um, but drafting your plan of study. So this is one of the things to focus on soon and, um, and even start now. And so, but the key word there is drafting, right? This is going to be a document that is going to be um, in flux, it's gonna change as your interests change as opportunities come up, as you know, courses get canceled, as all kinds of things happen. So you're going to draft a plan of study, which is just like how you think you want to get um, your coursework done. Um, you know, we talked about the number of units that you can transfer in. Um, there are two forms for that, actually. There's the one that you do on the grad path that you um, actually bring in the coursework and make it part of the university, the university um, record with us. So that's, when we talk about transferring, people use the word transfer in lots of different ways, but that's kind of the main way we talk about transferring is like you're taking courses from one institution and you're bringing it into the university. That happens through grad path. Um, you can take, you can bring in as many units, graduate units as you want at that point. You're not limited by the number that your program um, limits you to. Um, I suggest that you do bring in as many as you can because then you'll have this reservoir of courses that you can dip into um, if you plan to use them for your degree. So when, when the university looks at your request to transfer work, they're looking at three basic things. They're looking to make sure that you took it at an accredited institution, an institution that has an accreditation that the university recognizes, that you got an A or a B in the course, and that, it, and that it's at the graduate level. That's all they care about. They don't care if it actually works for you in any capacity towards your degree. That is delegated entirely to your program. Um, and so that's where your course substitution forms come in. So that's the second form. And that is a form that you find on the hub. Um, and that's where you, you use the course substitution form for required coursework, right? So you need to take, one of the courses you need to take is epidemi epidemiology 573A, um, like the basic epidemiology course. And you took that as part of your master's degree. So you want credit for that course. So you go and you get the course substitution form off of the hub. Um, you get the syllabus for the course you took. You email that off to the instructor who teaches 573A here. You ask her to review it for equivalencies. She looks at the objectives of the syllabus and says, yes, this does match what I teach or no, it doesn't. And sends it back to you. Um, I think you need your, I think it's, you, you need your faculty advisor signature on that as well. And, you know, if it's approved, send it on to me so that I can put it in your file for when that plan of study gets submitted. You don't need to do a course substitution form if it's for your electives. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, electives are electives. You know, they don't need to have specific objectives. That, that we're trying to be, that we're trying to meet. We don't have to have the course here at the U of A that you took at Tulane or wherever it was that you took it. You know, it just needs to have your faculty advisor's approval. Um, there's a little caveat there that I'll make, but I'll make it after I talk about minors. So master's students, MS students in the room, um, there's not an option for you to minor. Um, we, there's no such thing as a minor at the uh, master's level. Um, you're welcome to take extra coursework if, you know, if it, things beyond the minimum requirement, if there's something that really interests you out there, then go for it. Um, but for doctoral students, a minor is required. And part of that reasoning is that um, that really comes out of the university's identity as a research one institution and the kind of the philosophy that good researchers are interdisciplinary and work well with other disciplines. So you are required to have a doctoral degree in another area. Now, there, and it can't be in your own program. 
So if you are in health behavior, health promotion, you're welcome to do it in biostatistics or epidemiology or geosciences or whatever, um, but you wouldn't be able to do one in health behavior, health promotion. Michael? So that, that's, yes. Uh, Lisa had a question about the time limit on the course substitutions. Okay, great, thank you. So um, that's a good question. And so just to finish up on the minors real quick, um, that can be a place where you use your transfer work. Um, if you do a minor within the college, then everything I just said about the course substitution form applies. If you do one outside the college, then you'll do whatever their process is, okay? Now, as far as using previously earned coursework, how recent does it need to be? Um, this is one of those details that's different in every program. Some programs say it needs to have happened within 10 years of you starting the program. So if you took it in fall of 2010 and earlier, that's great. Um, if you took it before fall of 2010, then um, you may not be able to use it depending upon the program you're in. So please look at your handbook to find that out because that's not a detail that I have in my brain as to how all the programs differ. Okay, I'm gonna just pause again. There's another question too, uh, asking okay. if they can use master's level electives taken to fill U of A elective requirements. They were in social work, different type of course slash department. Um, yes, that is, that can definitely be, that can definitely be a, a possibility. That's a good question. Um, but here's that caveat that I was going to make about electives. And I'm going to make this caveat about apply also to the minor. And it's that quote from my um, gravestone. It's like be strategic and purposeful in the electives that you choose and the minor that you choose, because those are really there to help you prepare for, in my mind, you know what, and I'm one person and, and I have faculty advisors who disagree with me on this and that's fine. You know, everybody has different perspectives and I don't ever want you to take my opinions as gospel. I want you to take them as one opinion of many. And this is my opinion. Um, is that you should be purposeful and strategic in the electives that you choose and the minor that you choose because you want to be well prepared for um, your dissertation work and your career after this. And I think you can use electives and, and minors as a way to get knowledge and skills that will help you in your dissertation and work later. Um, but also in your career later. I think it's also kind of about networking with faculty who um, might be good mentors for you later on and help you to get into the career that you want to get. So it's great to use lots of your previously earned work because it streamlines things. And I know time is um, an important part of our lives and um, the money it costs to go to school is also a real consideration. So I really get that too. And that, and that makes a lot of sense if you wanna you know, maximize your previous earned um, coursework for those reasons. So no judgment at all on my end because it's, it's like whatever it takes, you know, but I want you to also think about, you know, making sure you're making the most of this as well. Do course substitutions need to be completed this year? It would be lovely if you got them done in the fall semester, actually. <laughs> and that's because it's in your best interest, I think, because it helps you to plan and know what it is you need to do um, in the future. Um, if, think, if, the, um, if the delay is not on our end, is there um, like a deadline that we could we can offer? I, I all I can do is encourage you to do it soon. I think your handbooks say that it must be done in your first semester. Yeah, so I'm maybe- not the, I'm not the, the kind of guy who's gonna enforce that though. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, if you get it done when you can get it done, 
Well, uh, the requests have been sent out a couple of times and I'm just wondering what the like borderline when you become annoying or if there's a deadline that says, hey, here's a nudge because it's due. Yeah, um, there's, there's, there's really not, there's really not. You know, occasionally like, yeah, there's not. <laughs> there just isn't. I mean, it's in your best interest to do it early just because then you, you know how to plan a little bit better. Um, you know, you, you bring up another point though, which is like faculty are tough to get a hold of. Um, so you sometimes need to be, you know, kind of persistent um, without being annoying. And that's a hard road to walk because I know I feel like really annoying sometimes. Um, but, you know, because I've got the same problems you guys do. It's like they don't respond to my emails any faster than they respond to yours, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, it's like I give it a couple of days, you know, depending upon what it is, you know, I'll, I'll you know, if it's something really urgent, I give it, you know, two business days before I email again. If it's not something tremendously urgent, I'll give it a week, um, you know, but and maybe some of our current students will have some insight on that as well. Okay, any other questions about this stuff? We kind of need to wrap it up um, because I do want you to have time because we're already three minutes past and there's some really good discussion happening and I appreciate that. Um, we'll, we can return to some of this again next Thursday, because I'll be presenting again next Thursday. Um, and we really kind of hit on things that I thought were most important, the things that I want you to think about. Oh, I want to talk about, I want to talk about one more thing. Just one more thing, which is the qualifying exam. Let me find. that to share with you all. So not everybody has to do a qualifying exam. It's, it's something that is required for um, the Masters of Science and PhD students in biostatistics and for the PhD students in epidemiology. This is something else that needs to be on the front of your brain, not this semester, but towards the end of the semester, but definitely at the beginning of the spring semester. And that is your, your, if you're in one of these programs, you're gonna have a qualifying exam in May or June. Um, and it's gonna be over the coursework that you see listed there. Um, epidemiology is going to have some very specific directions for you as far as attending um, an information session early on in the spring, spring term and identifying yourselves um, and your intent to sit for the qualifying exam early in the spring. Um, biostatistics, uh, Dr. Bedrick does a good job of getting you together um, to prepare you for your exams. Um, so both, both programs are definitely trying to like get people together and get you prepared well. Um, think about study groups. I think study groups are really important for the qualifying exams. So that's just the other thing that I wanna make sure I mentioned today. So keep that in mind. You'll get more information about that um, from your program directors and or myself, um, probably at the end of the spring term, but definitely at the beginning, uh, I'm sorry, probably at the end of the fall term, but definitely at the beginning of the spring term. Okay, so just one other thing to put at the, in your brains. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there and um, see if there are any last questions. Yeah, there's a question in the chat, Michael. Thank you. Would there be a qualifying exam for students who do minors in biostatistics or epidemiology but not majoring in them? They do not require their minors to take the qualifying exam. So good question. Some minors do have that though but not those two or any of the ones in our college. Okay, great. I'm gonna stop the recording.